When you hear the phrase Christian nationalism, what do you picture? If you had asked me this question four or five years ago, I would have said that I pictured something like this. Donald Trump, if you can hear us, please, Donald Trump, please save me. You see, I used to believe that Christian nationalism was essentially America worship, with just a little bit of Jesus sprinkled in there to try to stay on God's good side. But I have since come to the position that this is not, in fact, Christian nationalism. It's just plain old nationalism. There's nothing Christian about it. For a thing to be Christian, it must be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. So if that is not Christian nationalism, then the question remains, what is Christian nationalism? A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to attend the Fight Laugh Feast Conference, where I had the pleasure of interviewing many of the leading voices who are currently advocating for Christian nationalism. These voices include Doug Wilson, Toby Sumter, Chocolate Knox, Joel Webin, Stephen Wolf, and William Wolf. Today's episode of The Standard will cover a rather influential Baptist in the Christian nationalist movement, the one and only William Wolf. If you don't have time to watch the full interview, here is a list of questions that I asked so you can skip ahead to the questions that interest you most. And now, the interview. My name is William Wolf. I'm a Baptist. I am a graduate of the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I also spent a decade working in politics in Washington, D.C. And so what I'm doing these days is, uh, in many ways, trying to help make Baptists great again <laughs> and working to restore a more robust and biblical approach to uh, faith and politics in the public square. That is concise and exciting. <laughs> because I, I polled the good people of Twitter. Mm -hmm. very, you know, they're known to be very balanced. Salt of the earth. Salt of the <laughs> earth. You know, very mm -hmm. level, balanced about things. And I asked, hey, what are your concerns about Christian nationalism? Mm -hmm. It's a topic that's really kind of dull, to be honest. Everyone really agrees for the most part. Right. You know, but apparently there is a little bit of disagreement out there. And so I got a list of questions that I'm kind of going through with some people who are have become leading voices. And what, like it or not, yeah. people are starting to look to you. I've noticed on Twitter a lot of people are looking to you on, on this question of what is Christian nationalism? What are the boundaries of it? What's it all about? And so the first question is very simple. What is Christian nationalism? Yeah, I think most basically I would say that Christian nationalism is nothing more than an effort to recover historic Protestant Reformed Orthodox political theology and then apply it faithfully to our lives today in what could be called, as Aaron Wren has, a negative world. A world in which Christianity is certainly no longer sort of the socially favored religious um, you know, class in America. We live in an age post-Obergefell, we live yep. in an age you know, of transnation, and we, we have seen the, the myth of the secular neutrality shatter, I think in the eyes of many Christians who had bought into that myth in previous decades, and now many people are trying to figure out a path forward. And so Christian nationalism is really nothing more than trying to work out the implications of the fact that Christ is king. And he's not just king of your heart, he's king of the public square as well. It's an effort to interpret and explain Romans 13, that all authority in heaven and earth has been instituted by God, and there's no authority that exists that hasn't been instituted by him, and they're therefore responsible to bear the sword and act justice according to his good standards of good and evil. And that, to me, is Christian nationalism in a nutshell. That is probably one of the best answers I've gotten, that is concise. I really appreciate that. So with that, I, there's so many people that I, I think when you say that, when you describe that, they're on board with what you're saying. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of people right now that hear the term, the term itself, mm -hmm. Christian nationalism, mm -hmm. and it kind of gets people's hackles up. Mm -hmm. They feel, wait, doesn't that mean like that I hate black people or something like that? Mm -hmm. You know, like they're, they get scared of that term. Why would we adopt that term? Why would we use that term? Now, first, I would say that Christians aren't those who should make uh, determinations on language or linguistic preferences according to our feelings, yeah, right? It's so it's like we, yeah. we're not, we, we should not, and particularly as men, men shouldn't be making decisions off of whether something makes them feel scared, right? <laughs> this, is, this is a true point. Yeah. W women factor the vast majority of their decisions through an emotional framework of security. Right. How does this make me feel? Mm. And then... Um, Effeminate men and female adjacent men do the same thing, yeah. and so when ladies we're of both sexes. We, that's right. So <laughs> yeah. when we're uh, church ladies of both sexes, that's right. and so when we're considering ideologies, philosophies, political theology, the fundamental question that faces us 
shouldn't be how does this make me feel yeah. or what do other people think about it or how does it make them feel, but rather is it biblical, is yeah. it defensible, is it true? Right. So that's, I think, an important piece of context. Yeah. But then to the specific question of the term itself, well, let's break those two terms apart. Which one do you have a problem with? Yeah. And I'm yeah. riffing off of Vody Bauckham here. You yeah, said, yeah. do you have a problem with the Christian part? Do you have a problem with the nationalism part? Let's take the nationalism part first. Yeah. We live in an age of globalization, of multiculturalism. And if you're wondering how that's working out for the West, I invite you to go visit Europe. Right. Or go visit Dearborn, Michigan, where we've seen, uh, you know, we've seen people on American soil having pro-Palestinian you know, rallies. So globalism and sort of this idea of a free society, that open society that came out of the post-World War II era has been proven to be a failure. And we need to recover national sovereignty, close borders, maintain a cohesive civic polity and culture in a nation. We don't need to let the WEF or the UN tell us what to do in America. And so recovering first the principle of a rightly ordered nationalism is important. And nationalism doesn't need to be scary. It's just simply the idea that sovereign nations exist and they should have a right to self, uh, self-determination. But then if you're going to have nationalism, what type of nationalism should you have? Look, Middle Eastern countries have Islamic nationalism. Right. Europe, well, Europe is essentially just a secular globalism at this yeah. point. But here in America, I would say we still have the, the last gasps of a Christian nationalism. Yeah. And I don't think that's something that should just be discarded, but rather something that should be rightly ordered, renewed, and pursued for the present age. Man, I commend you on being <laughs> concise. That is well said. Thank you, William. <laughs> Um, that's, you know, I think you're really addressing people's concerns because I think it's the ism part uh, mm-hmm. that people don't like. They think that nationalism, doesn't that mean that I love my country more than God or something like that? And you say, well, yeah, but that's why we put the Christian in front of it. That's the, that's the key term there. Well, if you love yeah. your country more than God, then you're disordering your love. It's not Christian nationalism. Right. And so yeah. Augustine was very good on this, on the right ordering of our loves yeah. and that the chief affection of our hearts should be God, should be Christ, should be the gospel. But it's also appropriate to love those who are near us to us, nearest to us, more than we love others, mm. right? Like if you don't, you know, if you lock your doors at night, you're sort of a family nationalist. And how does Christian nationalism understand the boundaries between church and state? Yeah, well, I mean, it depends on who you would ask, sure. right? And, but I, I mean, again, I want to answer that question primarily as a Christian yes. and recognize that God has given certain authority to the state that he hasn't given to the church. He's given certain authority to the church. He hasn't given to the state. He's given authority to families right. that he doesn't give to the church or the state. Those are sort of the three main institutions of authority that you can find in the scripture. And they're actually represented by three different images, mm. right? So the state has the sword, the church has the keys, and the family has the rod. Right. So those are ways to think about biblical, the biblical nature of authority. And so, you know, again, in, in in an appropriately Christian Christian nationalism, we would never be arguing that the state holding the sword has the right to sort of uh, pronounce an affirmation or denial of your gospel profession. Right. Because that is a piece of authority that's been given to the church with a representation of the keys of the kingdom. That's good. You know, and so uh, Christian nationalism actually really isn't an effort to make the church be the state or make the state be the church, but really to call on the state to rule rightly and to honor God rightly. And then further to recognize, you know, outside of the boundaries of the government itself, we have a society, we have a civic polity, we have uh, you know, a moral character to the people of our nation. So what are, what are the things that we should be encouraging in our civil life? Should we be encouraging you know, uh, pride parades where we see men in tidy whities twerking in front of kids, right? right? Or should we be encouraging you know, truth, goodness, and beauty? And so when we, get, when we dig down to those questions, really the um, shiny object of the state church question, I think, fades away. Yeah. Also very important to remember that Christian nationalism recognizes the importance of particularity of people's customs, experiences, mm-hmm. and history. Right. So in the American context, we, we, we don't have a state church, and we're not advocating for a state church. Mm-hmm. In the English context, context, they do have a state church. And it's also very funny, I've noticed that many of the most anti-Christian nationalists in America are some of the biggest Anglophiles and love the coronation of, you know, the the latest (laughs) king. You know, in fact, one of the key critics of Christian nationalism from a very liberal Christian perspective, Paul Miller, you know, in his book Against Christian Nationalism, 
begins with this weird sort of discourse on how he actually sort of loves England more than America. It's like, well, buddy, that's got a state church last time I checked, <laughs> yeah. you know? And so, but look, maybe that was right for the English people at the time, but it's not right for the American people. Yeah. There's no one size fits all here. That's good. Yeah. The, the idea of honoring particularity is really good because that's something that's really lost. I think we have been, we, we, we bought into, instead of a thorough biblicism, we've, mm-hmm. we've bought into the classical liberalism mm-hmm. and been just discipled into that as if really... John Locke and those guys really had it all figured out when it came to a governmental system and they set the perfect thing in motion. Mm -hmm. Whereas, no, God in his sovereignty has different civil institutions for different periods of time. And that's that's an interesting thing to explore. We can do that at another time, but I, 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 I like that you brought that up. Well, look, classical liberalism is not some sort of deistic framework of, you know, moral government. You know, it wasn't something that, you know, we just set in motion and as long as you get the right technocrats, bureaucrats, and you know, politicians, this thing is just going to perpetuate itself. Yeah. It's not. In fact, there's a, there's a German jurist, uh, legal scholar, Bakkenford, mm-hmm. and it's, it, it, he has this idea called the Bakkenford Paradox, and he, he argues that uh, liberal societies, democratic liberal societies, can only ever be founded on Christian presuppositions and principles. I mean, that's pretty much irrefutable. T.S. Eliot, famous poet, yeah. also wrote very similar things in the idea of a Christian society and notes on the formation of culture, and yet Bakkenford concludes that liberal societies actually then always work against their own foundations in their liberalization. That is, that's something that I was just about to ask you and kind of bring up is, because there's, there's some people who are saying that, well, we are rotten to our core because mm-hmm. liberalism, we are founded on liberalism, mm-hmm. which has proven its fruit, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so why are we trying to get back to our founding if our founding was founded by like liberalism, what you're saying, but what you seem to be arguing is actually at our, the root of our founding mm-hmm. was a Christian, was Christian principles and fundamentally biblical principles. And there was a deviation mm-hmm. from that. And so we need to go back to the point of deviation. Would, would that be a fair representation? Yeah, that's right. Look, I'm not an expert on the American founding. Sure. So let's just throw that out there. But I listened to some very smart people like Ben Crenshaw yeah. at Hillsdale, who is. And I think it's fair to say that the American founding was a mixture of, you could call it a form of Christian nationalism. And there was certainly enlightenment thought that right. was in there. It was a classically liberal government. But I've said this before, and it's gotten some good traction, I'll say it again, is that I think that Christian nationalism was the assumed context of the classical liberal uh, founding of the American nation. But now that assumed context is totally evaporated. Yeah. And so as we can, we, you know, they assumed that the, the character of the people who were inhabiting the new American nation would be of Christian character, even if they weren't of necessarily Christian confession. Right. And that's not, you can't assume that anymore. So Christian yeah. nationalism in the American context could simply be seen as an effort to enshrine a lot of what was assumed at the founding. That's really good. I, I think it was James Madison who said uh, that our form of government is fit for a Christian people mm-hmm. and it's not fit for another kind of people. That's right. And yeah. then there's been, you know, there have been Supreme Court justices who have argued that this is a Christian nation. You know, that was Trinity versus the United States. Yeah, that's right. States. That wasn't a that wasn't a foreign that yeah. wasn't a foreign thought. Yeah. But the fact that it was understood to be a Christian nation didn't mean that there were only Christians here right. or that nobody who wasn't a Christian wouldn't be welcome. That's right. You know, but to have a core identity as a nation, frankly, has not only been pretty much a given throughout history, yeah. but it's a good thing to have. Yeah. And nowadays it seems that Americans are the only people who aren't allowed to have that. And I just don't think that's right. That's good, right? Mm -hmm. So what are some troubling things that you've seen, and how are you hoping to address some of those things? Well, I think the most most troubling or difficult thing is just the conversation itself. Mm -hmm. You know, people people approach it with a lot of wild assumptions Mm -hmm. about what you're talking about. You know, accusing people of wanting to strip other people of their citizenship and things like that, and not actually bothering, again, to dial things back and ask, what does God expect of government, That's right. right? Another troubling thing I would say that I've seen too is how Christians seem to essentially pull an Andy Stanley mm. and unhitch the Old Testament from the New, right? So, and I'd yeah. see in a lot of the responses from critics of Christian nationalism almost always begin with this phrase, nowhere in the New Testament do we see X, you know? And it's like, okay, well, look, the, the New Testament 
comes on the foundation of the Old Testament. You know, the, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed, yeah. primarily in the person and work of Christ. Right. But we also understand that all scripture is God breathed, right? Mm -hmm. There's no such thing as, you know, a red letter ethic that Christians yeah. can subscribe to. And so there are principles of justice and righteousness and good civil rule mm -hmm. that pervade the Old Testament. Proverbs is full of them, you know, First uh, and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles are full of them. We could look at how Daniel carried himself when he was a captive in Babylon. We could look at how the king of Nineveh led his people in repenting and honoring God. And so you have to, or you go all the way back to, you know, Genesis, Gen the foundational text for Christian nationalists is really Genesis 1, right? God created the world, God created man, he is the supreme authority. Right. Then we get principles of retributive justice in Genesis 9 that is authorizing the state to enforce, you know, enforce a standard of justice that is good and right and yeah. punishes evil and protects life. Yeah. Right? So even think about that. It protects life. So one of the things in the critics of Christian nationalism that they've tried to paint as sort of a key feature of Christian nationalism is simply being pro-life. Yeah. And if being pro-life makes me a Christian nationalist, somebody get me a Scarlet CN. I'll put it on my, I'll put it <laughs> on my right. lapel. I'll wear it. Right? Because, yeah. and, and really, that's what it comes down to. If you think the government should protect life according to God's standards, uh, well, congratulations, join the club. What would you say to uh, maybe some of the cage stage mm -hmm. Christian nationalists? Some people who are coming to these doctrines that you just described, mm -hmm. but they are rabid about mm -hmm. it you know what I'm saying and they're and they're going almost going looking for a fight mm -hmm. what warning or encouragement would you give to some of these cage stage Christian nationalists yeah well the first thing I would say is that you know Christians in America weren't the ones that were looking for a fight yeah. you know fundamentally the fight's been brought to us yeah. by the deconstructing secularists right. that want to unravel you know biology itself and so I think that many uh, many people so I'm a millennial and in the in Gen Z and beyond, I think you're gonna see a sharp uh, departure and adverse reaction to just the, the radical Marxist woke liberalism that's yes. been foisted down, you know, down their throats and through their schools. And so they're coming out of this saying that this is insane and I do want to fight back. And so I'm glad for their spirit. Another general thing I would say is that, you know, you can get, um, you can sort of, it's always better to have to try to train an attack dog to be sort of a little calmer, but you can't like kick a bunny into a fight, right? <laughs> so like I, 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 I'm thankful yeah. for men who are courageous and strong mm -hmm. and who want to kind of run to the sound of the gun. Yeah. I don't want to discourage that in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. um, I also, when I think about critics too, it's like I don't want to chastise somebody who finally does pick up a gun, yeah. right? You know, I don't, want to, I don't want to give them a hard time for being late to the fight. Mm -hmm. So that's the way I think about it. And so like my particular encouragement to those young men who are out there, you know, cage stage Christian nationalists, yeah. would be to, you know, as Stephen Wolf uh, would say, do the reading, do you the know, reading. actually do the reading, uh, be in God's word, That's right? Good. Be in the Bible, be in a good church. Yeah. Uh, this is really important. Find a church in which you can be um, confident and comfortable speaking out on these issues mm -hmm. and aren't going to be living in fear and dread of being disciplined or chastised for boldly defending God's, wor God's word even in an unwinsome manner. Right. So you find a good church. You know, I would say, look, I completely understand the need for some people to be anonymous. Mm. As I've said before, you know, some of my best friends are anon. I don't <laughs> yeah, even know who they. Yeah. I don't even know who they are. But they, if you're anonymous on Twitter, you shouldn't be anonymous in real life. Mm. You, you should still be in a healthy church and have good relationships good. with men who know what you're doing and can hold you accountable, not according to worldly standards right. of niceness and winsomeness, yeah. but according to biblical standards. Yes, that's so good. That's something I've been thinking a lot about with uh, with some of that aggression, some of that, there's a lot of excitement going on mm -hmm. in the movement. And uh, what, I, what I've been thinking about for myself is if you're gonna be talking about Christian nationalism, you had better be discipling your wife. Mm -hmm. You had better be living it, mm -hmm. you know, because it's one thing to get excited about a theology. It's another thing to be a person who is soaking, soaking in God's word mm -hmm. and enjoying it. You know, mm -hmm. so I think there's a it, when you get excited about a theology, you can just run for it. But then you can abandon the very, you know, like Revelation where John says you abandon your first love. Mm -hmm. That's what it's all about. Um, last question. Uh, all right. So you're a Baptist. Yes. All right. I'm a former Baptist. Mm -hmm. I'm a former Presbyterian. <laughs> oh, dude, I wonder if when, when we when our ships crossed. Yeah. Night, you know. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> That's funny. Uh, so I, so I'm, a, I'm a former Baptist. You're a Baptist. Uh, there's a little bit of hesitancy in the Baptist world mm -hmm. with Christian nationalism, namely because, and it's interesting, I didn't know that you were a former Presbyterian, mm -hmm. but there has been historic, actual real historic injustices mm -hmm. that Baptists have suffered at the hands of, you can call it a version of Christian nationalism sure. from the pre Presbyterian side of things. Mm -hmm. So as a Baptist now, how would you speak to that? How should Baptists be thinking about this? Yeah, that's that's a really important question. You know, the first thing I would say is that, you know, the reality of historical injustices don't negate the need to strive for something better in the present day. That's good. Right? And, you know, I, this is, I'm not 100% sure how to articulate this, but I do seem, I, I think I see a fear mm -hmm. from a lot of the sort of more moderate liberal or establishment Baptists mm -hmm. about the idea of a, a Christian nation and their priorities seem a bit misplaced. Mm. So, you know, I'll try this on for size. I think that I would, I would happily sacrifice, you know, a great extent of my religious freedom if abortion could be abolished in America. Mm. So who, what, do I, what do I care about more, right? My freedom to live and practice as a Baptist mm. or the fact that millions wow. of babies are slaughtered in America? Now that's a hypothetical, sure. right? That's a thought experience. Sure. I don't think that's where we're going and that's not what I'm advocating for. Yeah. In fact, I think Baptists should be on the, on the forefront of working to end abortion in America Absolutely. along with everybody else without sacrificing our religious freedom. Sure. Um, but back to the idea of historical injustices, you know, if we had some form of Christian nationalism, and under that form, persecuting Baptists was bad, by what standard do you judge that by? Well, you judge it by a Christian standard. And so in a new Christian nationalism, we want to work to have a better standard by which Baptists aren't whipped or flogged or sure. drowned, etc. And, you know, I would also like to remind my fellow Baptists um, that we aren't the shrinking violet in American evangelicalism. We're, you know, millions strong, right? So, you know, I'm pretty confident that if anybody's going to be doing the persecuting, <laughs> it'll be it'll be us. We check our own ranks. Yeah, there. yeah. I actually yeah. want to share a quote from a, a very widely respected Baptist figure, Carl F. H. Henry. Yeah. He founded Christianity Today. He was one of the sort of leading, you know, proponents of American evangelicals coming out of sort of a treatise fundamentalism mm -hmm. into a more robust public engagement. And and so in his sort of sixth volume you know, magnum opus, God, Revelation, and Authority, Carl Henry says this. He says, if modern culture is to escape the oblivion that has engulfed the earlier civilizations of man, the recovery of the will of the self-revealed God in the realm of justice and law is crucially imperative. Either we return to the God of the Bible or we perish in the pit of lawlessness. That's a lot of words to say it's either Christ or chaos. Yeah. And, and, and Carl Henry is arguing that we need to have biblical principles of law and righteousness for our society to avoid collapsing into the pit of chaos. Again, if you say that today, you'll be accused of being a Christian nationalist, to which I say to my fellow Baptists, follow in the footsteps of Carl Henry and let's join the front lines. That's great. That's a, that a good final answer. I think we'll wrap up with that. Hey, if you're still here. Thanks for watching the interview all the way through. Why don't you just go ahead and click that like and subscribe button so you don't miss any of the quality Christian content that's coming your way. Be on the lookout for my next video, which will include my interview with Pastor Douglas Wilson. And if you want to support what I'm doing here at The Standard, you can join my Patreon. A little bit goes a long way. If you do, your name will appear in every video and you may just get a personal shout out from yours truly. Today's featured supporter is Daniel Margheim in Hendersonville, Tennessee. Thank you so much for your support. You are making these videos possible. All right, that does it for me. Until next time, may you build, defend, and expand the kingdom of our Lord, Jesus Christ.